the pulmonary embolism is the third most common acute cardiovascular syndrome globally after myocardial infarction and stroke the incidence in intensive care unit population is 1 to 9.6% so if you are having a 10 bedded icu it is likely that you may be having one patient with a with a venous thromboembolism in that patient and you will be surprised that even if we give pharmacological or mechanical prophylaxis for dvt the incidence in such patients receiving uh, prophylaxis is 2.3% and one year case fatality rate is around 3.9 uh, is around 30% and one month case fatality rate is around 3.9% and <clears throat> in the us the data for india is not available there are three about 3 lakh deaths which happen which are attributable to pulmonary embolism in a uh, year so it is a huge disease but it is not it is under diagnosed so in western countries these days the people people have started recognizing this disease and actually are looking for it and over investigating for it so the guidelines which they are forming is to how to under investigate how to not go for ctp in every case but in indian scenario still we are facing lack of knowledge lack of awareness and still people are not aware about pulmonary embolism so uh, uh, coming to the predisposing factors so what are the predisposing factors or conditions which uh, uh, which which make a patient vulnerable to pulmonary embolism so there are some genetic risk factors there are some environmental risk factors and there are some uh there are some disease related risk factors which are acquired so what are the genetic risk factors they are protein c protein s deficiency factor 5 leiden deficiency anti thrombin deficiency so basically deficiencies of all factors which are which which inhibit thrombolysis or there is elevated factor 8 factor 9 or factor 11 so the from pro the coagulant factors are increased in the body there is dysfibrinogenemia there is hyperhomocysteinemia and there is prothrombin gene mutation so these are genetic risk factors acquired risk factors are suppose a patient has had a surgery or patient is having a, a underlying uh, malignancy patient is in having anti phospholipid antibody syndrome there are some infections inflammatory disorders nephrotic syndrome all these factors are are predisposing a patient to pulmonary embolism or venous thromboembolism and hence pulmonary embolism so we should be aware we are in intensive care units we are seeing all these patients patients are post op they are patient post operative patients patients with malignancy patients with infections inflammatory disorders so patient obese patients patients having a history of smoking so they are all having uh, are at risk for pulmonary embolism okay uh, so <clears throat> the risk factors have been divided into strong risk factors moderate risk factors and uh weak risk factors just a second okay so what are the strong risk factors so the strong why are we dividing the risk factors into strong risk factors weak risk factors moderate risk factors because the the evaluation and management of pulmonary embolism is dependent upon the risk of a patient the risk a patient is having of of getting a pulmonary embolism so what are the strong risk factors so the patient is having a fracture has had a fracture at the lower limb or is hospitalized with heart failure in the previous 3 months or is a, has had a knee replacement or hip replacement so these patients are immobile so they are they they are at risk because there is stasis venous stasis in which leads to which leads to venous thromboembolism and hence pulmonary embolism patient if the patient has had a myocardial infarction or the patient has a history of venous thromboembolism or the patient has had a spinal cord injury so these are strong risk factors so strong risk factors means we should the the risk of having getting a disease is more than 10 times the uh, as compared to other patients and for the for the moderate risk factors if the patient has had a blood transfusion central venous line chemotherapy has is in congestive heart failure is has hormone replacement is in on hormone replacement therapy the patient is a postpartum patient has having some infection so as you can see most of these the most of the spectrum of the patients which we see in intensive care units are covered so almost all intensive care unit patients are predisposed to uh, 
thromboembolism or pulmonary embolism so we need to be aware we need to be sensitive sensitized to it and we need to give uh, the, uh, prophylactic uh, uh, and uh, basic uh, pro prophylactic treatment so that prophylactic uh, treatment so that the thrombo the chances of thromboembolism decrease so uh, yeah so wh what happens when there is a pulmonary embolism what is the pathophysiology suppose and there is a pulm embolus which has gone into the west into the pulmonary artery so what will happen the pulmonary vascular resistance is increased so increase in pulmonary vascular resistance will uh, cause increase in rv pressure and volume and thus the rv will dilate because the rv wall are very thin so rv uh, 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 the right ventricle is not preconditioned to sustain or to uh, to pump against high pressures so it will dilate so it will dilate and try to pump so it will initially increase the pulmonary artery pressure which will cause increase in wall tension and myocardial stretch further increase in wall tension and myocardial stretch which will but but finally rv will not be able to generate the pulmonary uh, the uh, the pressure higher pressure and pulmonary artery pressure will not go above 40 to 50 mm of mercury thus the contraction time of rv will get prolonged because rv will want to get emptied before contracting again so lv filling is impeded in early diastole so because so what happens is rv is still contracting but the lv has gone into early diastole so this results in a reduction the filling of lv will decrease since lv filling is decreased the cardiac output will decrease the cardiac output decreases so there is a systemic hypotension and hemodynamic instability so what will happen because there is systemic hypotension the coronary flow will decrease the coronary flow decreases so rv ischemia will happen so there is a increased demand and there is decreased flow and thus it will lead to rv failure so this will happen if there is a major embolus in the main pulmonary arteries and because the the arteries where which have been obstructed the blood flow has reduced and the other the blood will go to where where the blood will go it will go into the capillary bed which is not obstructed so there is a, there will be a vq mismatch the ventilation perfusion will be mismatched because the ventilation will remains almost same in all the zones but the perfusion will be high in some zones or will be very low in some zones so it will lead to hypoxemia so if the in one third of the patients the patent uh, the operamen avail remains patent so what will help it will cause right to left shunt because the right atrial pressure will increase as compared to left atrial pressure so there will be right to left shunt and it will lead to further worsening of hypoxemia and if there is a embolus in the ra or rv it can go and embolize and cause stroke and if the embolus is very small distal it will cause pulmonary infarcts and alveolar hemorrhages so uh, this is how the uh, hypoxemia the breathing difficulty the hemopsis uh, the hypotension develops in a case of pulmonary embolism so uh, this is diagrammatic representation one thing more is that there will be myocardial inflammation and release of inflammatory mediators which will further increase the myocardial demand and in in case with the reduced supply it will uh, cause rv ischemia and failure and thus there will be decreased oxygen delivery to the systemic circulation so how do we diagnose so this is the, this is the most challenging as well as the most interesting part of uh, this conversation so how we diagnose a pulmonary embolism most of the signs which you will see have been written in the literature are non specific so what what has been written see the most common sign which is written is dyspnea uh, the symptom and most common sign which is written is tachypnea and the second most common sign is rails or crackles the third is tachycardia Uh, so these are the common signs which we see in all diseases be it be it uh, myocardial infarction be it pneumonia be it sepsis be it ards the patient will be dyspneic there will be pain in the pleuritic there will be pleuritic pain there will be cough so typical sign which is leg swelling and leg pain is is there in only one fourth of the patient because what i have seen is that most of the most of the patient most of the doctors or the residents diagnose on the basis of leg swelling they only think of pulmonary embolism and start uh, anti prophylactic anticoagulants in those patients who are having some leg swelling so that is you are missing 3/4 of the patients 
and hemopsis is present in only 13% of the patients so even the venous thrombosis which is uh, which is causing leg pain or leg swelling is present in only 70% of the patients who are having uh, pulmonary embolism so pulmonary embolism can exist in absence of uh, deep vein thrombosis also one more thing is that we think only that there is a deep vein thrombosis in the lower limbs only most of the cases it is true but even upper limb deep vein thrombosis can cause pulmonary embolism and we should be aware of it even if there is a swelling in an isolated swelling in the upper limb either of the upper limb we should think of pulmonary um, uh, of a chance is the patient having a chances of deep vein thrombosis and subsequent pulmonary embolism okay so so then the question again comes how to diagnose because these signs and these symptoms are non specific